Inflation is creating a situation where you're actually on an escalator and you are going down. But I have this belief that when you buy your dream home and you retire, you die. They watch me get promoted over all of them. <laughs> and there was some animosity there. What about guns? More guns or less guns? Like these are disasters. You don't want to end up in these kind of partnerships with real estate. All of a sudden, you would absolutely, almost without a doubt, see a softening of real estate prices in those cities. The market doesn't care that you waited four more years to buy real estate. I would not be surprised if he just charmed the whole country and stepped in and became the next president. All I was doing all day long was playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a very personable guy. I was a cop. I have extreme amount of regulation around me. At any point, FINRA or the SEC could just walk in my office. That's my whole point of this three pillars approach to wealth building, is it doesn't pigeonhole you into only one way to do it. Welcome back to another episode of The Meet Kevin Show. Today, we have David Green here. You are authors of the book, uh, Buy, Rehab, Rent, Refinance, Repeat, The Burr Book, The Long Distance Real Estate Investing, How to Buy, Rehab, and Manage Out-of-State Rental Property, and Sold, Every Real Estate Agent's Guide to Building a Profitable Business. And now you have a new book coming out. Tell me about it. And then we got to talk about what is happening in this market. Are we going to have another 2008? Right on, man. So this book is written as the antidote to the get rich quick culture that has made its way into real estate investing. I finally had it up to here with people coming to me and saying, hey, David, I have no money, no job, no skills, no credit, nothing to offer. And my life is terrible. How do I invest in real estate so I can fix the whole thing? And I just I wanted to help people. And I knew that giving you information about how to invest in real estate is the equivalent of giving a three-year-old a license to drive a car. It's <laughs> You need some skills before we get to that point. So I wrote this book, Pillars of Wealth, How to Make, Save, and Invest Your Money to Achieve Financial Freedom. And the idea is the blueprint that I use in my own life to become a multimillionaire. So I focused on saving money. I was very, very detailed about where every dollar was going and tracking that. And then I learned how to make more money. And I did that through working in restaurants and then working in law enforcement and then becoming a real estate agent. There's actually a skill to making money that anybody can learn. And then once you have some money, now you can go invest it safely. And it's just a different way to look at the world of real estate investing as opposed to what everybody hears is get rich quick, take my program, buy my course, and I will teach you how to turn a dollar into 15 cents or whatever the case may be. I mean, you're so right. It's it's this get rich a quick idea is is so sensational. It goes viral. It's so exciting. But then, unfortunately, I wonder if it's almost like we were talking about earlier when we came in. It's like there's so much like there's so many dating apps, and it's so easy yeah. to date. Everything seems so desirable. So then you just pick off what seems most desirable, but nothing actually ends up working out. Yeah. And that's very much in real estate where if we're left with, oh, the only way to make money is get a 10% cash on cash return, you just never end up investing and you never yeah. actually build out, as you say, the pillars of creating a strong foundation. Exactly so right. how should people in today's environment with, let's maybe start with the market and then kind of work from there. How, you know, how concerned do people need to be about this potential for a real estate crash? You know, there's little inventory, but people are saying the amount of buyers who have been buying throughout 2023 uh, might dry up, kind of like those excess savings have dried mm -hmm. up. And when those buyers dry up, even though inventory is low, month's supply will skyrocket and then prices will come down. What's your take? Everyone's always waiting for that crash. The question I ask is, what are you seeing that would lead to one? And I always hear crickets. <laughs> the, the people that are calling for the crash the most usually have no idea what would cause a crash. They just know that, well, we had one in 2010, so we're due. Yeah. Right, like we're supposed to have one. They don't understand macroeconomics. They're not following what the government does with quantitative easing. They don't know about companies like BlackRock that are buying up as much real estate as they can. And they don't understand, mm -hmm. to be frank, the fundamentals of investing in real estate are about more than just cash flow. Cash flow is sold as the foundation that you should build your entire investment portfolio on. In a lot of ways, those of us that own real estate realize that cash flow is fickle. It's a cat. <laughs> Sometimes it comes and lays on your lap and it lets you pet it. A lot of the time it just knocks stuff off your counter and makes a mess that you have to go spend money and clean up. You didn't. You never know how that cash flow is going to work. But things like equity, buying in the right locations, getting a really good tenant base, understanding leverage, buying the property right in the first place, you have a lot more control over mm -hmm. those things. I don't know if we're going to have a market crash. What I do know is right now, there are not a lot of cash flowing deals out there. Mm -hmm. We've seen interest rates double or triple and prices have not gone down. They yeah. might have dipped a tiny bit in some markets, but in general, they are holding strong. Yeah. I think interest rates will continue to go up and prices will continue to hold where they are because people only drop their prices. You're a real estate agent, you know yeah. this. Yeah. 
when you have a seller, you have a listing, and you're listed at six hundred thousand dollars, and Jerome Powell comes out and says, "Hey, we're raising rates." Do your clients call you and say, "Kevin, drop the price to five hundred thousand oh. dollars"? The market's collapsing. No, <laughs> no. When does a seller say, "Hey, I'll take less for my house"? Oh, time. They, That's they, it. Takes, yeah, they have to be on their ninety days, one hundred and twenty days pain of waiting, and they'll finally say, "What if we drop it ten grand?" It's always the same conversation. It's okay? so funny you say that. You're going in two thousand and eighteen, rates were. Uh, Jerome Powell was raising rates. Uh, you know, we went from like one and a half to one three seven or uh, one seven five, two, two and a quarter, two and a half. And uh, I remember that summer so st- uh, distinctly. I had seven listings, and we put these seven listings on the market. Then all of a sudden, we got another rate bump. Mm-hmm. Mortgage rates shot up somewhere around on mm-hmm. that one. I don't know why. Seventy five basis points to a full percent. And it kind of came out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Yeah. And it was like May of twenty eighteen, and all of a sudden. The buyers dropped off a cliff and I'm like, sellers, rates just went up. We need to drop the price. And all of them are like, man, you just want to make a quick buck, man. We just need to wait. And had they dropped it then, they, we would have sold right away, but they wanted to wait. So we waited and it, it was a fight. It, I mean, r- r- prices eventually stabilized. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jerome Powell eventually stopped raising rates. Surprisingly in America, things just they tend to work out in the long term anyway. Right. But I remember that panic of the moment. Yeah. Like, this actually affects buyers and sellers. Like, don't Not my care. problem. Don't care. <laughs> yeah. You, you got to sit on the market for three to four months before they're willing to start dropping the price. Yet every buyer out there thinks that when the news comes out and it says rates are going up yep. or whatever the the next economic cycle shows, they expect prices will immediately collapse. No. And it's not realistic. It works off of supply and demand. How many houses are for sale and how much demand are there right. for them? And it's the comps that make real estate so sticky. Uh, and so this is where... You know, you have sellers that are stubborn because they say, well, look, my house might yes. be listed at five ninety nine, but that one over there sold for five eighty, and mine is way better than that. And that that ego yes. makes real estate very sticky. It takes many months for comps to right. start coming down. That's a good point. Some markets, and, and you see this every season, especially back to school. Uh, right now in some markets, I'm seeing some houses that were selling for six have some active listings that are starting to stagnate around like 590. And we're like, oh, okay, there's going to be some fluctuation there. But I mean, is it like they're sitting at 400? Not like, a crash. No, of course not. Yeah. These are just the minor fluctuations that we see. Could we have a little downtrend going into the winter? Hey, look, every winter you do, <laughs> right? right? That's my take at least. Yep. November, December is when you go by. Don't let the secret out. <laughs> right. But in order for the real estate to drop in price to the point that it's going to cash flow really strong like people got used to, yeah. very hard to see something like that happening because yeah. there's still... Even though real estate is not as appealing as it was when rates were lower, it's still more appealing than everything else. It yeah. is still the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry. <laughs> Where else are you going to put your money that beats inflation? Yeah. So my take with this book is to say, look, if, if it's very difficult to get more income out of real estate through cash flow, yeah. then make income out of real estate through other factors like equity and tax benefits and paying down your loan yeah. and go make your money in the old fashioned way, (laughs) doing better at your job, starting a business, being an entrepreneur, actually be intentional about building the skills that people build in order to make more money, taking advantage of capitalism while we still got it. Let's hope it stays around for a while, but we don't know how long we're going to have it. Right. And then managing that money better. People don't, they often want, they'll do anything to make another $300 a month in cash flow, but they won't look at their personal budget at all and look at where they could cut $2,000 a month. That's so well said. I, I have this nightmare that it, it, we will run out of opportunities to make money and we'll just have like socialism and every, everyone will be in like yeah. a tube with a ready player one goggles and you know right. this will just be you all day long right that my nightmare is that because then i can't provide more value than somebody else because we're all just in the same tubes yes uh that that scares me i love that we are in an environment now where there's so many endless ways to make money there is no shortage of ways to make money. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's shocking just from the different businesses that we operate, from the vendors that we'll hire. You know, they'll say, we have this perfect solution for your problem. And then we get in, we're like, we could build something better. And as much as sometimes we get frustrated, we're like, no, we should be saying thank you. Mm-hmm. Because if, if other people aren't able to provide good value, we could provide better value. That means we can make money. Yes. So if we can provide more You're value. Empowered. Yeah, it's empowering. If, if the same is true at our job. If we can provide more value than our coworkers, we win. Yes. Like, 
it's a great opportunity. So I, I think you're, you're, it sounds like your book's right, right on the perfect uh, path of, of what we should be thinking about. Uh, not necessarily the most viral path of put everything into yeah. a money market fund and just sit around and do nothing. That's exactly <laughs> but, right. But what do you think though? I mean, people want to retire early. Can they retire early with real estate? It's possible. But, but the people that I know that have retired early and probably you would say the same, mm-hmm. They worked 10 times harder than everybody else to get there. And then oftentimes once they got there, they realized, you know what? Inflation is way worse than when I first started on this journey. My money's not going nearly as far as it did. Now I'm going to go back to work. Now, my take on this is that if you get to do things you like for work instead of things you don't like, you've won. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be you don't work. There's this idea in our culture that if you're working, if you're not sitting on the beach with a Mai Tai, you've done something wrong. That's what we all should be getting to the point. I should never have to work. That that's what financial freedom is. I just don't think it's very realistic from what I've seen in my own portfolio. You look at the second law of, I believe it's thermodynamics, is that if you leave things alone, they will fall apart and they will get worse. Okay. I like that. I looked at my own portfolio. When I stopped paying attention to it, even though I have an organizational chart and systems in place, the people responsible for those systems, when they're not being held accountable, yeah. they start doing a bad job. The money goes away. You started a business. You built it up. It's doing great. You stop paying attention to it. Yeah. Your employees start working less hard. Stop. <laughs> There's no accountability. It falls apart. Everything in life works like this. Hey, did you know you could now invest in my real estate startup if you're a non-accredited investor, which means almost anybody can invest at a one-to-one valuation. We talk more about what that means at househack.com and you should read the offering circular and the risks associated with that. But let me tell you, I'm very, very, very excited to announce househack.com is open to investors of almost all walks of life and incomes throughout the world. So whether you're international or you're in the United States and you want to invest, go to househack.com, learn more, send us questions if you have them at ir at househack.com, and we look forward to working for you as our investors. Thanks so much. Go to househack.com. Okay, like we've been sold this dream that you're going to buy a couple houses and then it's done. You, you get to retire. And those of us that have those houses realize there's still problems, there's still things that need to be looked at. It's just you shouldn't have to do the things you hate. I love that analogy. I mean, first of all, I, I, this reminds me so much of the thorough dom- uh, dynamics law you talked about. I think Ben Franklin had this quote, a used key doesn't rust. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and if you think about it, it's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you stick it in the slide every day and turn it. It actually functions, you know? Where, whereas if if you don't function, then then you rust and you fade away. I actually, I have this belief, and I don't know what I'll feel like when I get to like retirement age, but I have this belief that when you buy your dream home and you retire, you die. Like you just, you rust away and you die. And I, I am so excited about working that it doesn't feel like work anymore. Yeah. And I know that's frustrating for a lot of folks because look, I, I didn't love my job when I worked at Hollister. I loved it at first, but then I got a bad manager, a manager that didn't like me because I was a law enforcement explorer. I was doing ride-alongs. I had like 3000 hours of ride-alongs and, uh, the manager hated cops absolutely hated. So my schedule got caught. I got the worst duties, right? I hated working then. But now, you know, if you, if we can transition to finding things that we love doing, now it's it's fun because we can take that right. money we built and invest in real estate. Great analogy. Sipping those Mai Tais, I get to still sip Mai Tais. I just do it after work. You don't want to do it 40 <laughs> hours a week. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, food tastes best when you're hungry. Vacations are best when you're working hard. Yep. You want to have yep. a balance in life, right? So, I just had balance of a few Mai Tais last night, right, McKay? <laughs> what, what you hear a lot in our space is this formula that would say, make money or get money, borrow money, partner with someone else, buy houses, get cash flow, replace your active income with passive income and quit. And then when you look at all the people in the space, I don't know anyone that's done that. Yeah. Even yeah. the guys that own a lot of real estate, things go wrong. There's evictions, there's tenants, things break. You, you're constantly putting money into real estate, just like real estate is providing money for you. Yeah. And it doesn't always come from cash flow. Sometimes the value that you create in real estate sits in equity oh. or it comes through tax savings, right? But you have to be making money to take advantage of these tax savings. So my case in the book is that if you love mm-hmm. real estate yeah. and you want to get out of your job, get a job in real estate. 
Ooh, There's so yeah. much need for good real estate agents, good Ooh. loan officers, good property managers, good contractors, good design people, good bookkeepers, good CPAs. We are always mm. looking for someone oh, yeah. that has skills in these area as real estate investors. And if you're passionate about it, go be great in that space, make money, put that money into real estate. It's still possible mm. to do, yeah, but yeah. you got to work harder than you used to. I, I have this analogy that most of us think that we're standing on the stairs and we're halfway up. And if we're not working hard, that we're not getting somewhere in life, but we're at least not losing anything, that yeah. we have this ability to just sit where we are and we're okay. With how much money the Fed has printed, <laughs> inflation is creating a situation where you're actually on an escalator and you are going down. Oh, interesting. Not building wealth, oh. not trying to get ahead. Your your money is losing value. Everything is probably, in my world at least, food, gas, energy, vehicles, it's probably twice as expensive as it was three, four, five years ago. I love this escalator analogy. If you sit still, it's, I mean, it's moving down. You're losing yeah. and you don't realize it because everyone else is on the same thing and you're comparing yourself to everyone else and you're all moving down. If you want to get ahead, you're going to have to run up a yeah. down escalator, <laughs> which is going to be harder, yeah, but it's true. still worth doing right you, now. And you can do it. Yes. And you don't want to get clawed at the bottom of the escalator. I have this like, like childhood nightmare that I just cannot shake out of my head. It was my mom was watching the show, The Young and the Restless, or something like that. I don't know one of these like TLC uh -huh. shows or whatever. And the lady's on the escalator. She drops her her lipstick, and it goes down. And I don't know why it's so like dramatic in my childhood, but I just see it getting crushed by the claws at the end. Don't get crushed by the claws yeah. at the end. I'm you like, stay on too long. That's what's going to happen to everybody, <laughs> right? And you made oh, the good man. point. We don't know how long we're going to have capitalism. And when you move <sighs> into a socialistic economy. Your ability to create wealth is greatly hindered because, like you said, you're not you're not rewarded for providing more value. Everybody's in the same place. Yeah, and scary. so if you wait till you get all the way to the bottom and socialism kicks in, you may see a lot of the people that were upset that David Green is saying I got to work hard. Well, mm -hmm. I wanted to hear about passive income. We oh. may look back at these days and say, Oh, I wish I was in a point where if I worked hard, I could get ahead. And that's where all the haters are too, at the bottom of the escalator. Mm. Like it's, that's that's where like all the critical people are like, You can't do it. It can't be done. They're all at the bottom. So they're like, I got. I keep running, man. I don't want to be in that mess. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's what I take. And there's joy in the running, right? Yeah. A lot of the time, in order to make more money, you have to become a better version of yourself. Okay. You want to yep. sell more houses. You got to be more friendly, more knowledgeable, more organized. They're yep. all things that require you to step up your game. It, it's personal development that you use to succeed in capitalism. And oh, yeah. a lot of people get excited about real estate investing, which I love. I want them to. It's a great carrot. Yeah. But it, it also exposes all the areas where you're not doing great. Yeah, if you true. look at where your money's being spent and you can't control your spending, you've got some issues with discipline. Maybe you're relying on retail therapy to feel better about yourself, <laughs> right? Maybe you don't really want to have difficult talks with your spouse. And so instead of having those talks, you just go out to dinner and spend 500 bucks and you just use that as oh, a Band-Aid, right? Yeah. When you start looking at how you're actually spending your money, it reveals elements of ourselves that maybe we've been avoiding, but it feels mm. so good when you actually rip off that Band-Aid and get in there and fix that problem. I think one of the things that you mentioned uh, about, um, I think you said it in the discussion of property management and, and record keeping, bookkeeping, or, this is actually, I think there's a big opportunity there for folks to learn really good bookkeeping mm -hmm. because not only is that going to lead you to be accountable in your own finances, as you're saying, safe, but it's also going to give you a skill that, I would venture to say 99% of people are horrible at. Yeah. Like if you can run a perfectly reconciled QuickBooks or, or whatever program you want to use uh, for your personal life and your businesses, you almost can't lose. But now take that skill and like you said, become a property manager. Like here's, here's a way, you want to build a really big business and you want to get successful starting with real estate so you can buy your own real estate, start a property management company. Understand everything you can about bookkeeping so you run the best books possible. You become the best property manager possible in your area. And trust me, there was a lot of opportunity to be a great property manager everywhere around the country. Everyone hates property managers. Yeah. You yeah. treat property management like your clients are your class clients, but your tenants are your customers. Now, you build that five-star reputation, there's no way you won't become wealthy being a great property manager because here's the other way as well. As a property manager, you become a licensed real estate agent. What happens when those landlords are like, I don't know, man, I think the market's gonna crash, I wanna sell. They gotta call their property manager. Now you've got built-in clients to sell properties from. The number one way to get buyers as a realtor is list real estate. Yeah. 
So you get in on the ground floor in these painful times as a property manager where all the realtors are leaving the business. You're a great bookkeeper. You can build that five-star reputation. You're not going to have a shortage of properties to sell. Then you're not going to have a shortage of buyers. Convert your tenants to buyers as well. That is a multi-million dollar business idea in any city you're in right now, but it's very hard work, but it's doable. And you don't even see those angles if yeah. you're just thinking, buy real estate, get cash flow retired. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody. Well, look, the first thing people say when they want to buy real estate is, oh, I'll do the property management myself. Most people don't know the first thing about property management. It is a job. I say people should start by hiring a property manager and then learn and breathe and then transition to doing it yourself maybe in the future. Mm. People get it backwards. They're like, oh, in the future when I have all this cash flow, I'll hire a property manager and I'll have my Mai Tais. It should be the opposite. <laughs> you know, like build your own business first, learn what other people do and then improve on it. Yeah, and I just think of where there's opportunity. You have opportunity to build a business right now. Yep. You have opportunity to create equity in real estate. You decide the price you pay for it. You decide what improvements that you make. You decide how to read the comps. You don't have as much opportunity with cash flow. You're mm -hmm. dependent on what the market gives you. Yeah. And a lot of people have tried to avoid that by getting into the short-term rental space. <laughs> and as everyone has flocked there, what you've seen is that the demand for these is, is kind of stagnating or going down a little bit while the supply is increasing, yep. which makes it harder and harder and harder to run that business. You, what I'm getting at is you don't want to run in the same direction as what everybody else is doing. Oh, you're guaranteed to fail that. Do you think we're in a bubble for Airbnb? I think that certain markets, yes, yeah. definitely. And not only that, but you're seeing, even if it's not a bubble, you're seeing certain municipalities just coming in and saying, nope, can't do it. Yep. Incredibly unfair to the people that just signed up for a 30-year mortgage to buy a property and dumped a bunch of money into getting it ready and energy and effort and have done everything that they were supposed to do to succeed as an entrepreneur. And then yep. the, the city comes in and says, oh, we're just not going to allow this anymore. Oh, yeah. and, and you're up that creek. I wouldn't say that you could ever say that real estate as a whole is going to go up or down, but mm -hmm. you have to look at the individual markets. And in many of these markets, you are going to see that it becomes much tougher to run a short-term rental. And like you and I said before, there's people that are doing it, but it becomes their full-time job. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. It, it Really important. Go check out the Bigger Pockets podcast that we did with uh, David Green. I, I, I don't know. You guys might post after me, but stay, go subscribe to the Bigger Pockets podcast and wait for my episode. We talked a lot about that Airbnb becoming a job. Uh, so shout out for, for them, which also I got I to gotta shout out StreamYard really quick. StreamYard, we do all of our live streaming with StreamYard and some of our recording even as well with them. They're a great sponsor of the channel. Go to metkevin.com slash StreamYard to learn more about them every single creator or somebody who wants to be a creator should be using StreamYard. So shout out to StreamYard. So on Airbnb, is there a, a potential that in some of these markets uh, where people have gone in saying, look, I had cash flow in 21 and 22, yeah. but now they're like, oh no, I need to go long-term rental. And all of a sudden then they go from cash flow or like paying their salary as we're saying to negative cash flow. Is there a possibility that we're going to see some short-term rentals start getting liquidated and mass in certain markets? And could that drive prices down in certain markets? It would have to be so significant in most markets to drive prices down. Okay. I think it's more like if you get more of these short-term rentals put on the market and sold, it's going to be like pouring a cup of water on sand at the beach. It's just going to absorb it right away. Oh, wow. We need inventory in yeah. most markets. I mean, if you may live in Wichita, Kansas, and you have plenty of inventory there, but where you and I live in California, something goes on the market, it's getting offers in four days. So it depends on the specific market, but I, I think it could very easily, some of that short-term rental inventory could be sold off. You wouldn't even know that it happened. Wow. You would just have less competition or yeah, less yeah. competition for short-term rentals if you're someone who keeps it. It's so interesting you say that, especially about California. You know, People hate California and this idea of investing in California real estate. Here's one of the beauties about California real estate is this democratically controlled legislature that we have. It's like 77% Democrats. I ran for governor against Newsom. I tried. I tried, okay? But anyway, I <laughs> came in second place with recall candidates. The, the problem that you have in California is they don't build homes. Mm -hmm. That is actually a beauty as a real estate investor, because when you own real estate, the California government is basically increasing your property values because people want to live in California because of the weather or whatever it is. People do like California, despite what we hear on social media. And people who leave California are starting to come back to California or left during COVID. And so what's fascinating is when you have a government that doesn't want to build, you're really just increasing the value of all the real estate other people already own. Yeah. It's, it's a great hedge. I call I call the California government my hedge. <laughs> it's a good principle that applies in a lot of markets because the, the 
Frequent criticism of real estate is that it's too expensive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what's keeping it expensive? Supply. Yes. <laughs> and when there's constricted supply, but increasing demand, the prices are going to keep going up. So the yeah. very reason that people argue against buying real estate mm -hmm. is that it's too expensive is often the fundamental that keeps it a good investment <laughs> yeah. and makes it a safer bet. I mean, imagine <laughs> if we actually had a government that said, you know what, we're now creating, or even in California, let's say, we're creating... 20 new master plan communities up and down the, the entire state. And we're going to connect those master plan communities to the big cities with Elon Musk tunnels. Mm. And let's just say we could snap our finger and do that. And these master plan communities were each 20,000 homes. That's 400,000 homes. We could snap our finger like this and they're connected to the big cities. All of a sudden you would absolutely, almost without a doubt, see a softening of real estate prices in those cities. Absolutely. Because I can now get to the city quickly without living in the old crap. Right. And I could live in a beautiful new neighborhood with new schools and everything. But guess what? It's never going to happen because of government. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people want that to happen, Kevin. Yeah. They think if we could just get prices to come down, that they could be an investor. Well, here's what would happen. Yeah. It would be good for the economy as a whole if real estate prices came down. Sure. Yeah, I like yeah. the average person able to buy a house. 100%. Okay. Well, if that happens, more of them will buy homes and they will become real estate investors. There will be more supply on the market for tenants to choose from. That will push rents going down. That will make it competitive to get a tenant in a house. Mm -hmm. If you don't have fast Wi-Fi, if you don't include cable with your listing, if you tell the tenants you can't make noise, they'll just say, screw it, I'll leave you and I'll go to the competition over there. It would actually create a scenario where real estate investing was less profitable because prices and, and asset values are, go, are not going up right. and rents are not going up. Correct. And if we got what we wanted, it would make it less profitable to be in the business. Sure. And I, that is a, a common error that I hear people making when they're wishing it was easier. I wish it was easier because then I would do it. If it was easier... It would be worse for you. Yeah, there'd be less opportunity. A hundred percent. And that's mm. why when I wrote Pillars, or one of the reasons that I wrote it was to get people thinking the way we are talking. Yeah. You want to run towards hard. You want to look for barriers to entry in whatever you're doing because there's Love less it. people doing it. Yeah. I give an example in the book of a mechanic who works on a Honda Accords. Everybody knows how to work on Honda Accords. <laughs> it's not a valuable skill set to have in the marketplace <laughs> that you can work on an Accord, right? But what if you go do the more difficult path and you go tell your boss, hey, I want to learn how to work on those European cars mm -hmm. that made no sense. Yep. <laughs> you made your life harder. All your coworkers mock you. Why would you do that? That You're making it harder. That's stupid. You could just you know, change uh, fuel injectors over here. And it's the easiest thing ever. We're smarter than you because we're doing it easy. Well, then there's layoffs. Or they open a new opportunity for someone that because they really need someone to work on European cars, you command a higher wage because oh, yeah. you have a rare and valuable skill set. Mm -hmm. That is how people make money in a capitalistic environment. And somewhere along the way, we got poisoned in our mind to think that easier is better. Oh my gosh, you're so right about that. I mean, people couldn't get, people couldn't pay enough to get their Teslas repaired in 2018 and 19. And insurance companies were like, we can't afford to pay mm. for this because it's way too expensive because nobody was trained to work on these EVs for, for collision repair or whatever. Uh, so you're so right. And it's, it's so entertaining because I see it every day. Uh, and throughout my career, I've done this. I became a licensed agent, licensed broker, MLO, licensed contractor. When the drone license came out, I'm like, I'm going to get my drone pilot license, which was actually out of all those tests, I just listed the hardest test. It was like a mini pilot's test. Hmm. You would think it'd just be like, it's a drone. It's not that it, it was really hard. Huh. <laughs> it was crazy. Still passed it. But anyway, uh, I'm like, all of these barriers mean the other agents aren't doing it. That's right. That means I can succeed. Now, right now, I'm I'm regulated by, by FINRA, by the SEC, because I'm a licensed financial advisor. I, I just passed my Series 7 broker. We're creating a broker dealer. There's so much regulation. At any point, FINRA or the SEC could just walk in my office and go, give me your books, show me everything, right? I have extreme amount of regulation around me. But to me, I look at those and go, those are barriers. That means there's less competition around here. <laughs> and yeah. as long as you, you run your ship cleanly, what do you have to be afraid of? So There's a beauty in it. And there's a joy that is in taking the more difficult road and finding that less people followed you there. <laughs> and so the reward is bigger when you get there. Oh, and yeah. It's just a shift in thinking that if people are struggling with real estate investing or they're struggling with wealth building in general, oh. that's what I would tell like my nephew when he gets out of high school, right? Like, yeah. hey, man, don't ask the question of what's the easiest way to make money, <laughs> right? You're thinking the wrong way already. You're going to end up with the herd and there's not going to be opportunity for you. 
what do you think about this getting a job in the real estate industry? Sometimes I've, I've thought of it as almost like legal insider trading, where it's like when you're a broker or an agent or a lender or uh, you know, a property manager or you're in construction, mm -hmm. you have such a competitive advantage over the other per the the doctor who wants yeah. to get into real estate on the side, right? What do you think about that? Yeah, you're exactly right. You're putting mm -hmm. yourself in an environment where you're more likely to get what you want. It's mm -hmm. like the analogy that we often use is, look, if you're trying to get married, why are you trying to find a girl at a bar? Could you find a wife at a bar? It is possible. Ooh. Mathematically speaking, are you as likely to find her there versus somewhere else? Okay. If you're mm -hmm. trying to find deals and you keep going to roof stock or you keep going to <laughs> wherever and you're complaining like, I can't find a deal anywhere. <sighs> The people that are finding those deals are not going through the same channels as everyone else. They're not taking the easier path. Like you said, they're a contractor. They get called because gr grandma passed away and the house mm, needs a yeah. ton of work. And they're yeah. like, hey, well, let's look at this thing. Uh, we need a quote to fix it. And you're like, well, it's going to be this much to fix it or I'll buy it for you from you for this much money. They're literally doing what we're saying. They're taking the road less traveled. Yep, yep. Wow, that's so interesting. What do you think about this sentiment that's circulating now, though, about this anti-landlord sentiment, which is, oh my gosh, how could you go in there and buy a fixer-upper? You know, that's 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 what we do on a regular basis. How could you go into this neighborhood and buy a fixer-upper that's got, you know, water damage or fire damage or it's a hoarding mess or there's mold, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. How could you, how dare you go in there and buy it and fix it up and take that home away from a homeowner? What's your response to that? What would their, what would the homeowner's other options be? <laughs> if you, if they were selling or to buy? If they were trying to sell the property. Oh, well, yeah, that's the thing. If there was no investor who was willing to do that renovation, I guess they could just walk away and let the property default and lose all their equity in so it. So now it's a foreclosure. Now the bank takes it, okay? And then what does the bank do? They're going to go put it on the market and the investors are going to go bid on the property and they may end up paying even less for it as a foreclosure oh. than they, if they had bought it and then the person's credit is destroyed and all of their equity is gone. And the neighborhood just has a low comp that lowered everybody's property values. Yeah. Now yeah. I would point out that I'm not a fan of the people that go after 90 year old grandma who, who thinks a hundred thousand dollars is still a lot of money and they're taking advantage of people that yes. don't speak English or yes. they're older. They don't understand. But when there is a person who is, I'm going to lose my house. I have mismanaged my own funds. I've got three weeks to sell this thing before the bank's going to take it. And then I'm going to have a uh, foreclosure on my record. I won't be able to buy real estate for seven years. Um. You're helping that person in yeah. that situation. So you're really helping the seller by making sure they can maximize what they can get. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, and that's that they can buy real estate in the future. So what about once uh, once the property's bought, this idea that, well, if you're a landlord, that means you're renting a property to a tenant who could have been a home buyer. You're that's, not stopping them from that. Why don't, what stops them from going and buying a house? Jerome Powell. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at the housing market in general, it is very difficult to buy a home. I'm not without empathy for that fact, yeah. okay? But what yeah. we need is more supply. Yeah. It's the only way you fix this problem. In order to get more supply, you need yeah. less regulation. Yeah. We've voted the politicians into place that have put these policies in place. And you can comp you can keep complaining about politicians, but it's us that picked them, right? Yeah. So that negative energy where people just complain about things all the time doesn't benefit them. Mm. It's better to look at it and say, well, what is the market doing? Where are their opportunities? Regardless of if I agree with this party or that party, doesn't really matter with the reality that I'm faced with. Yeah. How do I save my money? Mm. How do I make more money? And, and what type of real estate can I buy in this market that oh, makes sense? That. Yeah, give me the rules and I'll find a way to play the game, right? That's it. So uh, what do you think, like how should people get started in actually buying real estate? Is, is it a good idea to get that like cosmetic fixer? Like we call it the wedge, right? Our version of the wedge is, hey, look, here's a place that's selling for, I'll use numbers that are relevant to a deal we just closed. We go buy a place for, you know, 475. It needs, you know, flooring, paint, uh, you know, the new faucets and the new countertops and some landscaping work, but it's in a 620 neighborhood. And so we're not going to put in, you know, a hundred and whatever that difference is, $140,000. We're going to put in like 40. Uh, so that leaves us with equity. So we call that the wedge. Uh, what's your take? Is that, is that, do, should people start with small wedges? Should people, you know, get into something that needs some work? What, what do you usually like to see? The more, so let me say this again, the stronger the financial position of the person buying, the more risk they can take or the harder they can swing without putting themselves in a bad spot. So my thought is we see the deals that make the most money. They're going to yeah. require the most work and the most risk. Yep. 
If you're someone who can't be disciplined with your own money, can't put money in reserves, haven't worked hard at your job, or have told yourself you're working hard when what you're really doing is just checking in, clocking <laughs> in, putting in your time, clocking out, you're not really giving it your best, okay? Then you haven't earned the right to go after those bigger deals. Yeah. And, and the temptation is to say, well, where do I go to find the good deal as opposed to who do I need to become so that I can get the good deal? Uh -huh, you yeah. guys can take down deals that maybe don't even cash flow because you make enough money from business that you can float that deal as it appreciates to sure. a really big degree. Right. Like the example, I remember I was walking on the beach with Brandon Turner. It's not as romantic as it sounds. That was happening. <laughs> with my ties? Yes, yeah. yes. And we're having a, like a philosophical conversation about real estate. And what had triggered it was this idea that we had been raised to hear cash flow is the only thing that matters. Mm. And I said, I was looking at like a mansion in Maui. And I was like, you see that house over there? What do you think that's worth? He's like, that's probably a, like an eight million dollar mm -hmm. home. I said, okay, in 10 years, what are the odds that it won't have gone up? He's like zero, <laughs> right? They don't, they don't let you build in Maui. It's on the beach. It's one of the best parts. That's going to be a 16, $17 million home in 10 years. And I said, okay, what if it lost a thousand bucks a month in rent? Everyone uh -huh. would say never buy it, but you'd be losing 12 grand a year to yep. make $7 million over 10 years. Like why don't we ever talk about the fact that that actually would be a good investment for a person that could afford to lose $1,000 a month? Now, not right. everyone can, right? Right. That was kind of my light bulb moment where I realized you can make even more money in this economy if you have money, if your financial position is strong. Yep. And when we don't have a lot of savings and the first thing we do is buy a BMW <laughs> or we're taking vacations that we can't really afford, right? We're not fighting to get the promotion and competing with our coworkers. We don't realize that you're robbing yourself of that profit. Yep. It's not just the cost of the car. It's the opportunity cost of what that capital could have done if you were in a stronger position. Mm -hmm. It changed a lot for me. I realized I want to run businesses. Is it more work? Yeah. But does it put me in a position that I can take bigger risks with real estate? Yes. And and like you mentioned, when the economy goes bad, which it has for us, it's been real. Interest rates going up has hurt me badly. Our Sorry. real estate team is selling a third of the houses they used to. Wow. The mortgage company is struggling. Like, it's much harder to make money in real estate. The properties that I have, I've run into some problems with. It's been a very tough time. But because I had so much money saved up, I can weather that storm. I just want more people to understand that that is how you build the confidence and you get into a stronger financial position, not looking mm -hmm. for an NFT or a crypto pump that's going to make you easy money that didn't require anything of you. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, too, because you... You started, uh, I can't remember your first job, but I know you were in law enforcement for a yeah. while. So how, can you walk me through that transition? Like how did you go and and make more money and and then apply it? When did you start applying that to real estate? Yeah, that story's in the book and it's a, it's a I here it's a good story. To me, it's just my life, right? Mm -hmm. When I was in college, I worked in restaurants. My goal was to save $500 a week. Now to do that, I couldn't spend a lot of my money that I made mm -hmm. and I had to work uh, more days. So if I wasn't going to make 500 bucks or save 500 bucks that week, I had to pick up another shift. I learned that if I stayed late and picked up the closing tables, I could go from five or six tables in the night to nine to 10. Oh, nice. 40% increase in income to stay one extra hour. Oh, nice. So I started asking to close every night. And if the other server said, no, I'd pay him 20 bucks so I could close. I'd pay 20 <laughs> bucks to make 70 or 80 bucks. Oh, that's brilliant. You paid off your coworkers. They thought I was dumb for doing it because they got paid to leave. And I'm like, I just made a, a what a 400% return on my money. If you I collect paid. all the tips. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> so I'm working at the best restaurant I can get into. I'm taking more tables. Then I realized that- Oh, if wait, I, that's a line right there. You just said you're working at the best restaurant you could get into. It was a steakhouse. I wasn't at Applebee's. Good for you. How, I was the but how'd you get there? there? Because you need experience to get in there. Yeah, I went in there and I said, I want a job. They said, you don't wait tables. I said, let me be a bus boy. Let me be a host. I'll work for free. They let me work for like three days, saw that I was good, said, okay, we'll give you this many shifts a week. And then when I had those jobs, when my job was done, I immediately went to the server and said, what do you need? I was helping make their salads. I was helping serve their tables. I was helping the bus boys with cleaning. I was even helping the cooks, bringing them sodas when they were thirsty. What happened, Kevin, was everyone in that restaurant started telling the owners, we love David. We love this kid. Oh, He's the best guy there. So I'm 18 and I have a job with 35 and 40 year olds that are feeding their families with this server job. And it was challenging. It was stressful. You, you have to do things quickly. I was always learning more about cuisine. I was learning more about wine. I didn't come from a family where we ate nice food and drank wine, but in that world, that's what it took to be good. Long story short, I uh, graduated college with a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. My school was paid off and my car was paid off. That's amazing. I mean, honestly, it's, it's chilling what you just said, because 
what you did is you provided all the possible value you could with your time yes. and energy, which is so incredible because you're not just f narrowly focused on, okay, now I got the busboy job. All right, I'm going to, the dishes are clean. You know, I clean the table and now I'm going to sit here and text for the rest of my time. It's like, well, what else can I do? Maybe I'll go sweep. I'll go bring some sodas to the cooks. I'll go help the service. That's brilliant. I mean, that that's clearly why you became successful. I and mean, that's no one amazing. stops you from doing it, man. There's not, there's no defense. <laughs> Nobody's going to say, no, 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 don't yeah. give me the Coke. Oh. I don't have to get around the offensive lineman to get to the quarterback yeah. to, to help somebody else. Like the only thing that stops us is us. Yeah. And it's a mindset thing. It's this belief that, well, they don't pay well, me enough. So when they pay me more, uh, I'll work harder. Oh, you just hit on another one. The entitlement. Mm -hmm. That's the entitlement of the society holds people so much back because the idea is, well, if you pay me more, I'll work harder. Well, that's the opposite of what you should do. It should yes. be, let me work extremely hard. And then there's no way you can work extremely hard. And the people around you not going, okay, we need to keep this person. Mm -hmm. And then we need to keep this person turns into we need to pay them more so they don't leave, yes. right? We need that to create opportunity comes. for that one. Yep. That's my hope with writing this book was for the people that never had a mentor that showed them these principles nice. that they could get it there. Yeah. Because what happened is I became the top server in this restaurant in Manteca, <laughs> California at 20 years old. Good for you, man. And I went and had reconstructive surgery on my ankle to, to fix some basketball injuries that were pretty gnarly. And when I came back, instead of going back to that restaurant, I went to a nicer steakhouse in a city called Pleasanton where everybody's rich. <laughs> and I drove about an hour from my house to get to that nice restaurant, an hour each way, but my tips tripled. Yeah. Well, right? you went in with now experience. Yes. You went in with no experience, got experience by providing more value, got way more experience than you thought you probably would have even bargained for, and now use that to increase your income. That's it. And then, and then I started at the bottom of the totem pole. And I had to learn even fancier stuff, even more expensive <laughs> wine. Like yeah. the pressure was on. I would go home and Google stuff about cuisine. How do you pair lamb with a certain kind of wine? Because when my <laughs> boss walks by, I want to hear him. I want him to hear me explaining to the customer yeah. things that other people weren't doing. Well, what do you right. think happens when the celebrity walks in? Uh -huh. It goes to me. John Madden, Al Davis, wow. if you know E-40, he's a big rapper in the Bay Area. He used to come in, right? Uh, the Oakland A's would come in all the time. I was getting the top people that were going to tip the best, that were going to share the best experience because I was the top waiter. And even yeah. though you're just waiting tables, this isn't like, this isn't the boiler room where yeah. you're making a ton of money. Sure. It consistently adds up. That was the money that I ended up making when I graduated college that bought my first real estate. Yeah. And then I yeah. became a cop and it became starting over there. What Amazing. do the good cops do? How do I become a better cop? What do I have to learn? Yeah. Who are the people I should emulate? What do I need to change about myself to be good in this environment? That led to overtime opportunities. That led to instructor promotions. It led to all of these things that made it easier to make money within that industry, yeah. Yeah. which then went into real estate. That's incredible. I mean, it's it's even just to the extent of you suggesting after work, it's okay, what can I do to be better at my job? I'm going to tell these stories or provide more value as, as a server. Uh, and then the people around you are like, how, how does he know so much? How? How did he learn all of that? We didn't teach him that. And then they think you're like a genius, right. you know? And it's it's just this like, it makes them then go, well, may maybe I need to figure out how to learn this stuff. And then everyone around you works better so and more funny efficiently. So you say that. When I took that first restaurant <laughs> job and I started as a busboy, there were already guys that had been working there as busboys before me. Yeah. They watched me get promoted over all of them. <laughs> and there was some animosity there. Oh, yeah. Like, it wasn't cool that I jumped ahead, right? Uh -huh. Well, what you found was that they all started doing what I was doing. And their promotion came much quicker after mine did. It literally did what you said, where the bar was raised for the whole restaurant. Yep. My boss saw that and put me in a position of authority because she wanted me setting the example. So now when the 20-person banquet comes in, it's going to David. <laughs> he deserves it, right? I ended up house-sitting for them. Like My boss loving me created privilege. That, that's how it would often be spoken about, right? Yep. But if you were a boss, you would give the most authority to the one that gave you the biggest return yep. on your money in your business. And then the, the other principle was when you hit a ceiling, which you usually will at most jobs, mm. you don't feel bad about leaving if you know that they couldn't create enough opportunity for you. Oh, that's interesting. So when you outgrow the company, basically. Yes. Ah, yeah. And I, would, and I went to her and I was like, look, I want to make more money. What can I do? Is there another management position? She's like, I'm sorry, David, you're already at what we have. This is the top. And see, that's where the, the restaurant's like... 
hey, you know, if you're maybe at a larger chain, it's like, well, there's corporate or it's yes. district management. And so larger companies do have more of that upward mobility. Yep. But you're right. Like at some point, cap out. Uh, at, at, at many jobs, and then but then you take all of that experience and that work ethic, and you start over, and you but do you it make faster more money. and better the next time. That's exactly right. Yeah. There is a rhythm to making money in a capitalistic environment, an mm. actual blueprint that can be followed. Yeah. And when you get a taste of it, it is so empowering. <laughs> it feels so good, right? Um, I wasn't going to work every day, mad that I had to work. I was going to work focused, like it was a sporting event. And I'm like, how do I give the best performance that I can? Yeah. When I get there every day before I go into work as a cop, I'd be praying, all right, help me do the best job I can help me to be as safe as I can help me to learn as much as I can. And then I start getting chosen for all the instructor positions. You mm -hmm. get a little bit more pay with that. Oh, yeah. You get a little bit better schedule, right? I have a point if you're an instructor that day and you're not actually working a beat, maybe you get all your work done in six or seven hours, but you're on a 10 hour shift. That's three hours to do real estate. Yeah. There's other opportunities that would come from so that. So how did you transition then from uh, law enforcement to real estate. I got my real estate agent's license because okay, sure. I was just yeah. referring all my buddies to realtors yeah. and then they would come back to me and say, hey, the realtor doesn't know. And I realized most realtors don't know as much as me because I just own some rental properties. Well, and if you're also a cop in the area where you're buying, you know the streets. You know, like, yes, exactly. Yeah. You know the areas. <laughs> I could articulate to my cop buddies why they should buy a house instead of rent. I could overcome all their objections. Well, it's cheaper to rent. Well, what if you put three cops in the bedrooms here? They all need someone to rent. You're going to be living for close to free. Does it still sound cheaper? I didn't think of that, <laughs> right? Then you sell them the house and then next year you can go tell them, hey, do you want to buy this one? It's got five bedrooms instead of three. You could do the same thing. So I started selling so many houses oh, that no. it didn't make sense to stay in law enforcement and I had developed some injuries sure. over the time. So I just made the jump. And, job, then, yeah. and then it's the same thing we said, you're at the bottom. Mm. You're selling houses. Uh, like I was not a very personable guy. I was a mm. cop. I, it I, jades you a little I, bit, the business. A ton, man. And like, <laughs> you get things done as a cop by yeah. having a rigid personality. Yeah. You get things done as an agent by having a very flexible <laughs> personality. So it was like the most stiff person ever going to yoga. Uh -huh. And yep. I did not like it. Like People in my life will tell you I was it was a hard transition Oof. for me. But building those skills to be more personable, to yep. be more articulate, to explain things, to overcome objections – led to me being able to form a real estate team mm. and not just be an agent, right? Nice. So as a solo agent, the most houses I ever had in contract at a time was like 12 in escrow. And that's a lot of work. Very hard, right? Yeah. As a team, we hit 53, 54, wow. right? It opens up doors. Now it comes with new challenges. Oh, yeah. Running a team is completely different than selling the houses yourself. Like the skills that it takes to be a good agent are not yeah. the same as the skills that it takes to run a company. Well, so you're going from customer service to business building. Very much so. And I started at the bottom and I sucked at it, right? <laughs> but you see this pattern of oh. like, if you show up every day saying, I'm going to work my hardest, I'm going to see the people that do it better than me and I'm going to copy them. Yep. I'm going to figure out what the client needs and how we're going to meet the demand of the market. Money finds you, mm. right? Versus the people that we've hired that are yeah. like, I don't want to have to show that person a house. It's far away from me. Or I don't want to hold an open house this weekend. I wanted to watch football. Like those are things that crush you because at that open house, you might've met two or three clients. One of them could have been a neighbor that you took the listing that you then sold their house and got a buyer out of that deal. Like yeah. these exponential things that create wealth mm -hmm. only come when you're in the game and you're playing it. And I'm passionate about trying to get people into the game, right? 100%. And when you're hearing the the point of view of real estate investing that, hey, just buy some properties, they take care of themselves, sit on the beach with the Mai Tai, you're not in the game. Oh, for sure. Well, it's so interesting you said that about the open houses. I had uh, this, I, I realized how beautiful open houses were uh, as an agent when I could go back and calculate that I was making thousand to two thousand dollars an hour mm. from open houses yeah. because you're really shooting fish in a barrel the problem is we don't think about it that way because we think we do the open house and then we go home and we're tired and we're exhausted oh i had to put all those signs out oh it's five hours out of my sunday i could have been watching the game what a pain in the butt but the business cards you handed out the 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 connections you made the sellers who are going to sell in the next six months who came in to survey the market and get yeah. to know you and see how you run your business you didn't even know they're like oh i'm just a neighbor and you're like oh it's just a neighbor no that's a future seller right those all of those connections that just makes so much money per hour. But again, the problem with our society is we're, we're jaded to think that, well, if I don't get paid more up front, I'm not going to work That's as hard. It. But if you actually work really hard at that yeah. open house, knowing it's going to come, it's just going to be delayed gratification. 
then, then, that, then you do what nobody else is doing. That is in the book. I talk about that exact <laughs> problem yeah. is people don't want to hold the open house because it's not guaranteed money. <laughs> if you true. paid them $25 an hour, they would go. But like you said, you made $2,000 an hour. Oh my gosh, yeah. I, I talk about the 1099 mindset versus the W-2 mindset. Uh -huh. And most of us have sort of like been born into the matrix where we were shown W-2 jobs, yeah. right? I show up, I'm at a physical location. They pay me money to be here. And while I'm here, if I have to work, that sucks. Versus a 1099 mindset that gets no security. There's no floor, yeah. but there's no ceiling. There's nothing that stops you from being able to do more. You have to deal with uncertainty if you want to get the big payoff. And you ha and in the 1099 world, I liken it to a cat that has to hunt its own food. Mm. But it gets to pick what it wants. It gets to eat really good. It gets to be like buff and strong and powerful because it's hunting versus a house cat that just wants someone to bring its tuna. When you're the house cat, you don't get to choose what you're given. Yeah, that's interesting. You, you have to, and then everyone yeah. complains and they grumble and you hear all this. It's not fair. I don't make enough. There's no opportunity. The government needs to do something to fix this for me. For, the house cats never talk like that. Hmm. They're like, I'm just going to go learn how to hunt and find what I want <laughs> in life. And they're happier people, even though they have less security. Yeah, I, I think that's true. People always wonder like, well, well, you know, what is the definition of happiness? And I, th I think when we're 18 or whatever, people think, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm going to get paid six figures and I clock in at eight, I clock out at five. When the reality is it's usually not money. I mean, some degree of money helps because then you don't have financial stress. Like once you get above financial stress, that's great. I think statistically that's like seventy, eighty thousand $80,000 a year. But beyond that, more money usually doesn't change much. What what changes happiness for people and sort of your base level of happiness, so we're always going up and down on that base level, but what raises that base level is failure and achievement, mm. right? Getting through hardship, but then coming through that stronger mm -hmm. and then succeeding. Because mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you get almost this success high. Yeah. And then it makes you want to, okay, well, let's try something else. Okay, yeah. that's not working. Let's try something else. Some people call that flip-flopping. I, I, I call it like necessary. Yeah. You, you have to change and just keep looking for that success being that house cat. Hunting. T Tony uh, Robbins refers to that as progress. He says human beings are happiest in life when ooh. they are making progress. Oh, I love that. If you think about every time in life that That's you've it. been at a peak, it's because you are seeing that you are making progress. And in the book, I actually, in the offense section, that pillar, mm -hmm. I talk about ways to hack into that part of your mind and measuring things so that you see your progress and you stay yeah. motivated to keep going when the money's not flowing in yet. Yeah, I like that. Progress. Yeah, I did not know that about Tony Robbins. I've, I've read Tony Robbins books, uh, some of them, uh, but wow. I mean, that's a perfect way to say it. Yeah. And, and if you think about the W2 mindset that says, I want to go to work and I have to exist and I have to be here and I'm in a bad mood, you're not yeah. making progress. That's why Congress is so unhappy. There's no progress. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So what do you recommend to like the 18 year old today? What, what do they practically do? Like step one right now, you know, they're watching. I'm like, I want to be the house cat, man. Like I, I, I get it. Capitalism. Okay. I'm in step one. Can they look themselves in the mirror and say that they're doing the best possible job with the job they have right now? Let's say they hate their job because they're working at Jamba Juice and they're like, I don't even like this job. Are they the best Jamba Juice worker in that store? Ooh. Okay. Are they tracking how fast they can make a smoothie compared to somebody else? Ooh. Are they literally looking at the steps? Like what I would do, and I'm not exaggerating, yeah. when I was in the restaurants, we had to make our own salads, pour our own soups, run our own food. We didn't have support. I would visualize what the process was to make a salad. And this sounds cheesy, mm. but like I can still see it in my mind. You had the different bowls for the different dressings. Your le My left hand would be trying to grab the bowl that I needed while my right hand was reaching up and to the right and opening the salad container, grabbing a handful of salad, which was the same every single time. Mm. At the same time the bowl was coming out, the leaves of the salad were going in there. My right hand would go to scoop the dressing as my left hand was grabbing the fork to stir it. The dressing would go in. I would switch from my left hand holding the fork to the bowl. My right hand would grab the fork, I would stir it. I would visualize this process, which people think may sound extra, but when you're stressed out and you're super busy, saving seven seconds on a salad, if you're making like 30 of them in a night, when there's a point where every second counts, was in, what made me faster than the other servers. And I could keep up with the table rush because I would do that with everything. Mm. If they're on cruise control and Jamba Juice and they yeah. hate their job, 
they're going to be on cruise control if they get a better job and they're going to lose it. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay? When you get to be, you're the fastest person at Jamba Juice. Now yeah. that like what I tell my teams and my businesses do it faster, better, and with less mistakes. You're unfireable then. Yes. <laughs> so you're faster. Now, are you doing a better job? Are you giving better service to the people that walk in? Are you cracking jokes with the customers? Are you recognizing that person's waiting? It's a long time. Let me say something nice to them. Let me give them a free something to make it easier. Let me get wow. them to come back in. And are you doing man. it with less mistakes? You yeah. control that, okay? Yeah. What I've found is there's a measure of faith, yeah. but when you are doing that every single day, if your boss is not giving you the opportunity, which they may just not be able to, when you go get the better job somewhere else, you become the best person there too because you built <laughs> these habits, right? Yeah. And it was somewhere along the way in America, we got away from that approach that we had that made us into this amazing country is we took pride in our work. You went to work every day and said, I'm going to learn a trade, I'm going to get good at whatever that thing is, whether it's writing a book or stacking mm -hmm. bricks or, or being an architect or keeping somebody else's books or being a CPA. There was a, I want to be the best at this thing. They knew they were in a competition. The good news is if you're the person that takes that route today, there's no competition. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, this is like music to my ears. I mean, what you're saying is, is you're so right about everything you just said. And I love this idea of how with your visualization, what you did is you went to the micro. You know, I think people think like, oh yeah, I'm going to run a business and it's going to be really efficient. And then they think of it from a top level that, oh, I'm going to, I'm just going to make it efficient. Well, well yeah. how, yeah. how do you make it efficient? You make it efficient because every little micro thing yeah. adds up. And then the efficiency of every little micro move makes the sum so much more productive. It's, it's as detailed as like, why is every employee typing every property address out uh, every single time they're writing an email for real estate? When everybody should be taught to have shortcuts. Okay. It's, it's escrow one, two, boom, types out one, two, three, East main street, Ventura, California. Like now they wrote two, they had two or three keystrokes as opposed to 25. Right. Like all of those little micro things add up in a massive way. And I think that's what you just described. I couldn't agree with you. More. That's about the pursuit of excellence, which is one of the chapters in the offense. <laughs> wow. So what I'll tell the loan officers that yeah. work at the one brokers, that's my mortgage company. Yeah. They'll tell me I'm busy. I don't <laughs> have time to lead generate. Okay. Uh -huh. And then I'll sit and watch them work. Oh no. <laughs> and I'm just watching as they move the mouse through the different screens that they're trying to navigate and I'll watch them do it and I'll say, let's have a race. Mm -hmm. Let's see which one of us can get through this faster. You've done this for years. I just watched one time how you did it, right? But I'm visualizing where the parts of the screen that they have to click. When it's a process they do over and over yeah, and over, yeah. right? And I'll beat them every time <laughs> because I'm focused on how quickly I can click through where I am to get to the part where I even have to type something in, Right? okay? They're just on autopilot. I'm here, I have to work, I'm typing at a speed that's comfortable for me, I'm thinking right. at a speed that's comfortable. And then I get the excuse of saying that I'm busy. <laughs> and I'm not trying to sound like a tyrant, okay? They're yeah. in a 1099 position where they have unlimited income potential, sure. but they are taking a long time to do basic tasks that oh keep gosh. them away from the dollar productive activities that are gonna make them right. money. We control that, Kevin. Oh my no gosh. one is there stopping yeah. them from typing. There's no one moving the computer around like when you're playing a sport and you have a defender. Yeah. It's our own selves, our own brain is it, what stops us from making money. So, so relatable just to this idea of when I got into the real estate industry, uh, you know, I'd have a listing and somebody say, oh, we're going to send you an offer. I go, great. When can I present it? You know, I can meet my seller in 45 minutes. They're like, oh, well, I got to drive to the office. And then, then I got to write, the, oh, then I need to make a coffee. And then I got to write the offer. And Woo, and I got to get signatures. It takes them like all day yep, to write an offer. they it's call like, that work. Yeah, it's like, well, no wonder you're busy. It takes yep. you all day to write an offer. Uh, fast forward to, to the system that I got down is I had a laptop stand in my car. I had templates for drafting the offer, templates for signing the offer. Did you offer. have a cover sheet made with the client's name already all in it? All of it. All of it. It's, it's not that hard. Yeah. Uh, and 99% of these offers, oh, the details are the same. You're just changing the parcel number, the address, the client names. Right. The vast majority of it is the same. You're using the same forms. There's no excuse not to have the same, essentially, cover sheet and format and escrow opening email, you know, yeah. template in your DocuSign, whatever. There's no excuse for any of that. So we should get this down to, it should be 10 minutes. This offer should be 100%, done. 100%. And you shouldn't consider writing an offer work. Okay? That's just the thing I have to do. It doesn't count as work. Work was how many conversations I had, yep. how many houses that I found for a client that they might like. Those were things that counted as work. Nice. Nice. I had a thought a minute ago. I'm trying to remember <laughs> it's all right. what it's, it was. It's those efficiencies, though. I mean, you're right. It's, it's probably related to just that because I, I think that 
is, I really like this thinking down to the micro. How can you make all of the little steps that you're doing in your life slightly more efficient? And it's your responsibility to do it. And yeah. nothing, everyone listening to this can improve their performance. Yep. It's a different way of thinking though, because it takes the attention off your boss. Yeah. Right. My real estate agents will complain. The buyers aren't motivated. Like <laughs> I want an easier client to sell a house to not, I want to be a better agent. Like, well, what can you do to increase their motivation? Bingo. How can you find them better deals that they would be happy with? That's a completely different question than it's their responsibility. Right. I liken it to the person who's having a hard time dating. Okay. Ooh. They can't find a spouse. They can't find a girlfriend. They're just struggling. Most of those people think I, my one is out there. Uh -huh. If I just wait, I'm going to bump into the one that likes me for me. It's going to be okay that I'm 35 years old and I live with my mom and I eat Cheetos all day on the couch and oh. I don't have any confidence and I, I'm not funny and I'm not in shape and I'm not any of the things that the opposite sex wants. Okay. okay. I need to find the person that's just right for me. Mm. And some people you could say, listen, you're the problem. There's a thing that women like. And if you become more of that, you're going to have your pick of which one you want. And if you don't become more of that, you're always going to have this problem. You control this, right? Some people get angry at that. They don't like being told that they are actually empowered to fix this situation, okay? They want to believe this dream that there's a perfect person out there for them like they saw in the Disney movies and they don't have to change anything. I think a lot of people go through life doing jobs like that. Mm -hmm. My boss wants me to be there at 9 o'clock. I don't like it. I'm going to find a different job. My boss micromanages me, meaning that they want me to get things done in a timely fashion. I don't like it. Let me find another job. This job's hard. This job's complicated. This job doesn't fulfill me. You see what people do in dating happens in the workplace too. Wow. But the people that are good with the with their dating have figured out, I got to become what the market wants. <laughs> and the same thing is true in capitalism, right? Wow. So I'm just passionate about the people that don't like where they are in life. I, that's great. You're listening to content like this. You should be. It's not enough to know it. Are you doing the best that you can with where you are? Because what I found is when I did, I hit a point that I recognized it doesn't make sense to work here. I need to, I need to step up. And if my boss couldn't provide the opportunity, I had no guilt about finding a better job and I made more money and I nice. built more skills and I improved myself. And then I hit a ceiling and, and success for me came just like a series of stairs. Yeah. It was just stepping yeah. up consistently over. And, and even right now where I am, if I want to get to the next level, there are things that need to change with me. I need to be better at holding employees accountable. Mm. I need to be better at paying attention to detail. I need my energy levels to be higher so that I can come in focused every single day. And if I don't do that, I don't deserve more money. I think I like this idea of the stairs up. I think uh, we generally think we, we, we need the rocket ship, you know, the yeah. lottery ticket. Yes. But that's not how you build all of those micro efficiencies or what you were saying about uh, dating and capitalism. It's almost like dressing a real estate property in the uniform. It's really hard to sell a property when there's dirty clothes all over the yeah. place and the paint isn't yep. even, you know, tidy and, and it's dark. So you change the light bulbs and you touch up paint and clean a little. It's not Do you that say, hard. no, 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 the perfect buyer isn't going to mind the dirty underwear <laughs> on the floor. It'll be perfect for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, we changed the property, right? Yeah. It's a great example. I mean, I... I don't have experience really dating other than once uh, uh, because uh, well, I, I met my wife through this. And uh, what's incredible is I always wanted a girlfriend, but all I was doing all day long was playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> That's a great so, example. Yeah, right? so like I literally... Did I was, girls love that? No, I was... Well, you went to my, back then, MySpace page. Right. And was it like me being out there happy in the world and productive? It was screenshots from World of Warcraft. Right. <laughs> so like right. my identity was sloth and not working, right? That was my identity. And so it, it's really weird, but I, I went into uh, 2008, January. I quit World of Warcraft. I started running, working out. Hmm. Uh, and, and not much. I'm much more of a cardio guy than a weights guy. Uh, I don't know if that's obvious. But anyway, then uh, you know, then I, I would go to the beach so I wasn't like super pale in, in Florida or whatever. And when I did all these things, I met my wife by like April 1st. <laughs> you know, we've Complete been Complete coincidence? That, do you think it just happened to happen or do you think there might be a... a Correlation. I think it's what you're saying, man. Yeah. It's, yeah, you, you've got to, you got to set yourself up so you're actually marketable. 
That's a it. marketable product. What do what do other people want? And yeah. and it works in dating, but it works in capitalism. It works yeah. with making friends. If someone's listening to this, they don't have any friends. Maybe you're just not a good friend yourself. <laughs> maybe you're selfish. Maybe you're boring. Maybe you don't bring anything to the people in your life. And that's not. It's okay to say that as long as your next step is what do I have to change? Right. It's a completely different way of looking at the mm. world than what they get told by the average TikTok influencer that wants their views, wants their follows, wants their subscriptions, and says you're perfect the way you are. Let me tell you a way to make money that doesn't require you to do anything hard. <laughs> it's just a lie. What do you think about like the whole Andrew Tate is, I don't know how much you followed Andrew Tate these mm -hmm. days, but he's obviously pretty big at, uh, you know, uh, some people call it toxic masculinity. Some people are like, no, he's motivating people to get off their butt and work. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your take on Andrew Tate? Let's, let's say both of those could be true. Okay? okay. He has some views that are, that could be considered toxic. And he also is motivating people to get off their butt to work. Why not do what he does when it comes to motivating yourself? And then when you get there, don't live the toxic life that you don't like about him. Why don't we have more people that are like, you know what, that's a good point. I'm going to get in yeah. shape. I'm going to make more money. I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to build better relationships. But when I hit that peak, yeah. I'm going to get married and be good. I'm not going to go date around if that's what your problem is with yeah. Andrew. Interesting. Interesting. Nothing yeah. stops people from doing that. Yeah. Yeah, pick, pick and choose what you like. You know, yes. I, I, I say this uh, even just about other YouTubers. People, people are like, Kevin, I hate this about you, but I like this about you. And I was like, well, take what you like and just ignore the other Bro, stuff then, you know? Like, literally, pick and choose. when I was a cop, yeah. I would look at the cops that were really good in um, stressful situations, okay? Mm -hmm. But they were maybe terrible talking to people when they were amped up. Uh -huh. I copied how they acted when they were stressed out yeah. and I ignored what they did when they were rude to people. Then there were other cops that had a great mouthpiece. They could talk to them. They could sell snow to an Eskimo. <laughs> and I was just fascinated. Like, how did you do that? And I would want to be like them, but I didn't want anything to do with their physical fitness. Uh. Like we all recognize greatness in certain people. Okay. There's a musician you love that makes great music, but you would never want your hair to be like theirs or something. Okay. That is what, smart people do is they look at who's good and they emulate that. The okay? parts they want. Yes. And so the criticism of other people actually hurts ourselves mm. because our energy moves away from how could this person benefit me? And it moves into, I'm going to criticize them so that I don't have to change. And it only hurts us. You just end up playing more World of Warcraft and not having a girlfriend. <laughs> hey man, wow well, was fun. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. Some, some different topic things. Uh, who's going to win the election? Oh boy, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a pessimistic person in general. I always plan for the worst case scenario. Really? It's probably my okay. law enforcement background. Okay. I just assume the worst, right? Still jaded. In a sense. Yeah. yeah. I, I am nervous as a Californian that Gavin Newsom can just pull the wool over everyone's <laughs> eyes. Like we live in this state and we've seen the objective measurables, but he's so charismatic and people <laughs> tend to make decisions off that. Yeah. That like, I would not be surprised if he just charmed the whole country and stepped in and became the next president. Uh, you know, it's actually, it's so funny you say that I was live streaming, uh, the uh, Republican debate. And then afterwards, Fox interviewed Gavin Newsom and there were comments popping up. They're like, I had no idea this guy was so likable. <laughs> Even though some of the stuff he yeah. was saying was like, dude, you're lying about that or whatever. Like, okay, that's true, but that's what I always like to fact check. But it's like, the way he says it is great. That's how, he, that's how you become a good politician. Yeah, it's not crazy. from doing things well. It's from making people like you, right? But here's here's my uh, take on it. Because some people listening to this will support Gavin. Some won't. Some sure. will be angry. Some won't. It really doesn't matter. It matters who becomes our political leaders, but it doesn't destroy my ability to be happy, okay? If we have a certain political party, like let's say we have the one right now that stays in place for another four years. There are ways to succeed financially and otherwise yeah. in that economy. Yes. Getting mad and just screaming about who the person is doesn't benefit me, mm -hmm. right? I want a better life. If this person becomes president, this is the road that I will take to get there. If this person does, I'll tweak it this way. Mm. But ultimately, keeping my attention on what my goals are stops me from getting angry about things that I can't control. Oh, I love that. That's great. Focus on what you can control and what you can't. There are some people who I, I see they write these comments. They're like, I would never buy real estate until Biden's gone. Are they just shooting themselves in the foot? It doesn't make sense. Why <laughs> they? Like, I don't know if it's like a... Uh, if it's an idea in their head that that like that philosophically they've proven a point or something, but like <laughs> the market doesn't care that you waited four more years to buy real estate. You just are four years behind on paying down that mortgage and four years of rent increases that you missed out on. Nailed it. 
What about guns? More guns or less guns? I'm kind of a fan when it comes to that of the state rights. I, and okay. I go in general to everything that we argue about abortions, guns, mm. I don't know, whatever other hot button topics that's going to piss everybody off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let the state choose. And if you like it, go to the state that has it. And if you don't, go to the state but that what doesn't. What if you love California, but you hate their gun policies? I think, I mean, I think a mature person would just be like, I mean, you could vote for it, but you're going to get outvoted. The, I think in general, the majority rules, even if I'm in the minority, uh, you have to, if you believe the majority rules, it can't only be when you're winning, right? So okay. I'm a proponent of guns. My my law enforcement career, I don't think I ever saw anyone ever commit a gun crime with a licensed weapon. Yeah. A hundred percent of the weapon crimes that we saw were people that were not supposed to have them, yeah. right? But I can also recognize that if like everyone else around me doesn't want them, my ego can take a backside and I can say, okay, like if I, if that's that important to me, I'll move to a state that has them. And I think that trying to keep the whole country in the same uh, value system is what's causing the nasty fighting between everybody. Wow. If it was just like, Hey, you got that corner, you got that corner, go to your own corners. We would see way less anger between the two political parties. How'd you become so logical? That's a good question. <laughs> somewhere along the, the process of waiting tables and working in law enforcement and, and running a, a real estate team. A great job. I mean, it's really incredible because it's it, it, usually, I mean, there's there's so much emotion, especially today. And I think to some extent, social media enhances that, specifically short form social media. You yes. know, what, what's your take on that? Like the Instagram shorts, the TikTok shorts, the Twitter, you know, the viral kind of uh, headlines. My take on that is that nothing in life is free. Okay. People think mm. that if I get my education off Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, it's free. It's mm. not free. Okay. And that's not bad, but no one does things for no reason. That is a human nature, right? That's why capitalism works because you're incentivized to do the things that people want to get what you want. It's why this is the, the best political or economical system you could have. When you're watching short form content, the person is making it for a reason. They are trying to get views because they can get more subscribers because they can be monetized in some other way or they're putting you in a funnel. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's bad. It is reality. Mm -hmm. So when you're watching a eight second clip because you've decided that you're only going to watch eight second clips because you're not going to discipline yourself to look at more content, you've also put yourself at the mercy of somebody who does not have your best interest at mind. They might, they probably don't. Wow. They have their best interest at mind and they have to give you some clickbait. They have to give you some sensationalized thing. This is why Andrew Tate blew up so much as he was able to say something controversial in a short period of time. It pissed everyone off, but it got everyone talking about him. Wow. Okay? understand how that world works. And if you choose to get your information from free sources, there's still a price you're paying. You're going to have to weed through what you're eating and pick out the bones. There's going to be a lot more, or they're going to be putting unhealthy dyes in that food, right? Like it isn't all pure. And I think as long as people are smart when they show up and they realize that they're going to be okay. Mm. But most of what I, my, my like uphill climb in life is I'm trying to get people to stop believing the stuff that they heard in these eight second clips. Right. They've got this belief that like, no, the perfect girl is out there for me and she's going to wake me for what I am. Right. And you're That's like, the Dan Locke. <laughs> yeah. You, you got to stop thinking that the world owes you what you want and start thinking, well, how do I become what other people want? Right. Mm -hmm. Like that is in general, my friendship with Kyle, he's here with us right now. When I, when we were first becoming friends, I was thinking like, you know, what do I wish I had in a friend and how do I become that for someone else? And it led to me having a lot of friends. I've been the best man in four weddings. Wow. Yeah, right. But it's yeah. a different way than like, let me just go find the friend that makes me feel good. Wow. And not think about what that person would want. So in, in pillars, I talk about how in the defense pillar, we are unaware and ignorant of how much money, energy, and effort is spent to separate us from our money. Wow. Okay, there are professional marketers that are incredibly skilled yeah. at making me think I need this thing that before I watched that commercial, I didn't even know I needed. Making wow. me think that my life isn't good enough unless I have that. They are smarter than me and they know that they're in a battle. I'm wandering through a battlefield of, of economic proportions, clueless that there's bullets flying around me, not right. realizing how many people are trying to separate me from my money. Sure. And it's not until you start tracking that money and you give it a plan. I want to save this much money yeah. to, to buy my first house or to pay off this debt. 
that's when you become aware, oh my God, everything, I want to spend money on everything. Right. It's so hard. Like I heard you talking earlier about a new wallet you have, right? You have yeah. cash again for the first time. <laughs> Isn't it harder to spend cash than it is to put something on a credit card? Oh my gosh, it, yeah. It's painful. Apple Pay is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it hurts to be able to spend money in cash. That's how it used to be to spend money all the time. We've got money that just flows out of our account like nothing and we don't even think about it. So and, and social media works the same way. A lot of where we spend our attention, these are not our friends. Interesting. It doesn't mean you need to be paranoid. It doesn't mean you need to get better. It Just be critical. Yes. Because I mean, like, obviously, yes. so you you have books that people can buy. You know, I have things that people can buy as well or invest in or whatever. Everybody has something. But that doesn't mean, the like, just because somebody's selling something that the, the value is bad. Correct. It's just on the individual recipient to select, okay, well— I agree with this. I like this. I, you know, maybe I want more of this. Maybe I want more detail of some of the things you hit on and someone buys your book or, or whatever to get more detail on that. Is that what people have to do? Is that what you're saying that people have to sort of segregate? Like, okay, do I like this underlying content or, or what do you, what do you recommend people yeah, do? When you dated your wife, did you just find the first person that would talk to you and say, I'm going to marry her and see how it goes? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. There's like a process we call dating or courtship where you're evaluating each other yeah. to decide, would this person be a good fit for me? And part of that is, do they have my best interest in mind? Why do we not look at these educational opportunities the same way? Yeah, I see so, what they're selling. Yeah. They're making me want this thing. Is this a person that I can trust that what they're telling me is going to get me to where I want to go? And do I want my life to look like what their life looks like? When you see some 24-year-old with a rented Ferrari talking about how you can have this too if you just take his course on crypto trading or whatever, odds are this person is full of it. Okay. And like I, you should be expected as a person who's going to pay the money to do a little research before you say that's the road you're going to take. And one of the ways that in my life that I look at making sure I'm not being deceived because people can make claims all the time yep. is does this thing they are selling me work at other areas in life? Okay. If they're saying you can make money easily. I yeah. say, can I get in shape easily? Yeah. Can I make my partner romantically happy easily? Right. Are really good, strong friendships easy to make? Nope. They all have fundamentals. If you want to get in shape, you're going to have to play defense, which is watching what you eat and offense, which is exercising. And there is no way around that. Okay. The ab roller and the thigh master and all of these <laughs> things that were so popular because they were easy. They didn't work. Shake weight, man. Yeah. The shake weight. There you go. Like, <laughs> but everyone buys them because that's what they're looking for. Right. If you want to try to avoid being taken advantage of, just ask yourself the simple question of do other things in life follow the same principle and work. Can we get a shake weight on the table here? <laughs> Hilarious. Wow, man. This has been really insightful. What what am I missing? Uh what what el what else should I be asking you? Like what should people wait until rates go down, I guess? Like maybe what what do you think? Or just buy good deals now? Like I don't know. What what, what else? Let's use a sports analogy. Let's say you're a football team. Okay. Okay. And what you want to do is is throw a long pass. Okay. That's the equivalent of I want to buy real estate. And and it used to be that the team that you were playing was stacked against the run, and you had a lot of opportunities to throw the long ball. You did really good. Yeah, yeah. That's the last 10 years of real estate. Okay. Now, now they're getting through. Now, now you're looking like, oh, man, they're in a deep zone. I got uh -huh. nowhere to put that ball in, and my margin of error is very small. Does that mean you should quit playing football? Mm. Or does that mean you should look to run the ball or throw um. shorter passes or find a way? Because the defense can't be strong at everything at once. Economies <laughs> are like that, right? Oh, wow. I, what I'm seeing is there is much more opportunity in business than there is in real estate investing. That doesn't mean don't invest in real estate, yeah. but I, maybe I was 80% thinking about putting my energy there. Now I'm 80% putting into business. Okay. If you're not willing to adapt, yep. you just get frustrated and you complain and you scream and you bang on your keyboard and you, you talk bad about whatever people are doing stuff. If you're willing to adapt, you don't get stressed. It's like, okay, what are the run strategies I should be learning? Who's a good running back that I could be following? What are the people that are making money in business and what principles are they following? And if we do go into a recession and it becomes harder to make money in business, well, real estate will probably be cheaper and you start throwing the ball again. That's mm. my whole point of this three pillars approach to wealth mm. building is it doesn't pigeonhole you into only one way to do it. You don't get these people that are like, well, I have no money. So how do I partner with someone to buy real estate who also has no experience? Like these are disasters. You don't <laughs> want to end up in these kind of partnerships with real estate. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No kidding. Which we talked a lot about on the bigger podcast, mm -hmm. that bigger pockets podcast, which definitely watch that when it drops. So, um, what, this is amazing. What am I missing? Just the idea that we are in charge of our own future yeah. and it is not going to be easy, but that's okay because everyone listening to this has been successful at something. Yeah. Okay. We all have a genius. 
And those that are good at whatever their thing is know that it didn't come easy. They had to perfect the craft. If they're a great musician, if they're great with fitness, if they're a great conversationalist, if they're great in social settings, they put effort into developing that skill. Business is just another thing. Finances are just another thing. There are fundamentals that you can learn. And if you are willing to self-improve, you can do this. It's getting all that bad information out of your head where you've been told it's supposed to be easy or real estate will just provide a bunch of cash flow. You don't have to do anything. Fall in love with the process of becoming great. Wow. What, that's, that's so amazing. How do people get in touch with you? How do they buy your book? Shout yourself out. Thank you for this. Thanks, man. They could go to biggerpockets.com slash pillars. They can get the book there. Uh, and please do, and then and then let me know what you guys think about that book, because this was the hardest book I've ever had to write, but uh, it's probably the one I'm most proud of. They can find more about me at davidgreen24.com or spartanleague24. Sorry, let me say that again. At davidgreen24.com or spartanleague.com. That's the mastermind that I run. Or they can just look me up, davidgreen24, on social media and send me a DM. Amazing. Really amazing. Incredible nuggets in this. Uh, love it. Uh, it should definitely motivate you to check out the book because there's, if it's got nuggets like this, it's, it's going to be amazing. So Thanks, man. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Which I say, yes, meet Kevin. Where does this mean we are in the economic cycle? Should we be thinking about buying real estate? Should we be thinking about buying stocks? I have a background in real estate as a real estate agent, real estate broker, real estate investor, a stock market investor, and fund manager. Why not advertise these things that you told us here? We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Always great to have you on Kevin Pafra, there, financial analyst and YouTuber, meet Kevin.